What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another video. In today's video, we are going to be taking a look at five NFL draft sleepers. These are pretty deep sleepers for the Detroit Lions. So let's get it started. No, I got a shout out, Dosa D, uh, man, because it was actually the first time I went live on YouTube. And, uh, you know, guys don't know Dosa D, uh, he put out a lot of good content for the Detroit Lions. Welcome everybody to another video, glad you guys are here. And yes, we have a sleepers video. Now there will be a part two to this video because there's a lot of sleepers to look at and I really tried to dig into my bag. Carrot bag? Look, oh, there's a couple carrots in there. I really tried to dig into the bag and pull, pull the, really try to dig into my bag for this one to pull out some deep sleepers. Now one of these players may not be as much of a sleeper anymore, which is, Pretty, pretty unfortunate because uh, we had him as a sleeper a while ago. But, you know, we'll talk about him in today's video. So there probably will be a part two to this video. But I thought we'd just mix it up. You know, have some fun with it, talk about some sleepers. And I'm going to try my best to keep this video short and sweet. I know every time I say that, that does not happen. But trust me, I guarantee this video will be less than 20 minutes. Challenge accepted. I'm going to fly through it, okay? Mission failed. We'll get him next time. If I do pronounce these names wrong, I apologize. You guys know I'm bad with English. So let's get it started, Okay. Now, I shouldn't say that. Some people may think I speak a different language. I don't speak a different language. I just barely speak English. All right, the first player that we have on this list is Shemar Jean Charles. I know you're laughing. You're like, oh, it's Shamar, Shamir. I, I don't know. Yeah, when I watch the film, there's no sound. It's just the players, so I don't really hear them. And I never really look up how to say their names. I'm like, oh, okay. So, yeah, I apologize for that. But this is the cornerback out of Appalachian State. And, by the way, I did give you some diversity in this. Do not double up on any positions. So, we do have uh, different positions here. So, keep that in mind. But the first player we do have is a cornerback. And Gene Charles last season, man, oh, my goodness. Phenomenal in terms of production. I mean, just tremendous. On 52 targets, he allowed 17 receptions. Okay, now let, let's let this sink in for a second. The guy was targeted 52 times and gave up 17 receptions while making 18 plays on the football. That's pretty good. There's not that many guys that have allowed this low of a catch rate while on this many targets. Okay, we've seen low catch rates, but not on this many targets. Targeted 52 times, only 17 receptions. That's a 32.7% catch rate. He also did give up two touchdowns, but he had one interception as well. The numbers are just phenomenal. And that's the first thing that catches your eye. But then when you watch him play, there's there's something to like about watching him play. At 5'11", 190 pounds, the size is the biggest concern. We'll get into those in a second. But let me talk about the things that I like. Okay, the things that I like about Charles' game here. First off, the energy that he just brings with him every game. I've seen a few players like this, but he brings it as well. He just always seems like he's jacked up, ready to go. He he takes himself responsible for mistakes. You know, he's hard on himself, but he just flies around. He's got tons of energy with him, and I feel like that's the type of player that other players can feed off of, and I really do like that for my cornerbacks. I like my cornerbacks with some energy. First thing you'll probably notice if you watch him play. Secondly, he's consistent. Week in, week out, game in, game out, he has shown consistency for Appalachian State, which I think is important because, you know, you get those prospects that have one really good game, the next game is bad, and it's kind of like this. That's cool. You know, it's fine. It's like, oh, they can peak. But then you start to question, why did they, you know, struggle here? Why did they struggle in this game? Really didn't have that many issues. He was pretty consistent for the most part uh, last season, which I think is a very big factor. He also has special teams impact as he has been involved in special teams. So for the Detroit Lions, we're talking about sleepers here, right? So this is probably day three picks. A lot of these guys, it's, it's you're going to really struggle to find a role sometimes early. So for them, if they can play on special teams, it gives them somewhere to at least start. And I know that he can bring that to the table as well. He said himself, he called himself a football junkie. The guy that watched this film, I, I was with, listening to some interviews. I probably should know how to say his name if I listen to the interviews. One more thing that I really like about his game, this specifically comes in coverage, is just his point of attack. Now, when this ball goes up in the air, he thinks it's his, right? He's going to go fight for it. He's going to go try to make a play on the football. And he's extremely aggressive shooting down on plays. When plays are in front of him, when he can see the action, man, is he scary. He's scary. And that could definitely benefit him in zone, but it also could benefit him in another area in a second. But so I think he has very fluid hips, the flexibility there to transition and go run deep with you. And those cornerbacks that don't have that were like super clunky. That worries me. But I know that he can flip his hips. He does give out some separation on breaks clearly. Uh, that's definitely something that he does do there's a lot of cornerbacks that do that as well it's very tough to find corners that are really tight out of breaks consistently i thought rodarius did that and that's why we did the video on him that's where people question his size at 5 11 190 he's not that big so you wonder what his role will be the next season not saying that's too small to play on the outside 
but people do question whether physically he can hold up on the outside. I think he could, but if he had to move the slot, I don't think it'd be the worst thing in the world because that deep ball speed, things like that isn't the best, but I definitely think that with his point of attack, I think he could easily slide into the slide at the next level. It may take some time, you know, to adjust to the short area situations, but I definitely think he could play that role at the next level just because of the energy that he really brings off if he can't play on the outside again, assuming there. So I think there could be some versatilities to his game to push him into the slot. And like I said before, he he plays well when things are in front of him. Playing from the slot position, you're getting a lot of quick passes. Things are going to be in front of him more often. And plus, when he drops into the zone, I like him there. He struggles with tracking the ball in the air sometimes, uh, turning around, flipping his head around to make a play on the ball. And that's why his interception numbers are pretty darn low. You know, two interceptions in the last two years combined. That's why they're low. Honestly, it reminds me a little bit of Cornelius Elder. So there's improvement. Obviously, there's things he has to improve upon if we're talking about sleepers here. But he can definitely play. And I love his aggressive nature. I, I just like the way that he kind of handles himself on the field. The competition, of course, could be a question, but with a lot of guys on this list, that will be a question as well. And another issue with him playing on the outside is not whether or not he brings, you know, the mentality to do it, but also his length. Very short arms. So that can definitely be a problem of also trying to come up with interceptions, you know, being able to be a playmaker on the football. Now, I don't think, I don't know if he'd be able to cover tight ends because of that length, but you could probably slide him into the slot. But I definitely think that he brings the type of attitude and energy that you want. And of course, the production backs it up consistently last season. So keep an eye on Charles there and see if the Detroit Lions maybe try to scoop him up. I don't think he'll hit UDFA. I'm rejecting him to be around six picks somewhere in there, but we'll see. The next player we have comes at the receiver position, and yesterday we went through some late round receiver targets. As you guys can see, I'm hopping back in here. Uh, so the player that was actually supposed to be here on the list, I'm wearing a different shirt. The player that's supposed to be on the list is actually to not declare for this year's draft, so I had to get somebody else. It was uh, Reggie Roberson. I didn't ever hear about this guy until today. And I was like, oh my gosh, how have I never heard about him? How is this guy like not on draft boards? Well, it's because he's not declaring for the draft. So I get, yeah, that makes sense. That, that does make a lot of sense. So I had to think of someone else to throw into this list. And I think I found a good guy to put here. That's kind of similar. I, I don't know if I, if I say similar, but he is a receiver and he has some similar traits. So that's why I'm putting him in here to kind of replace our man, Reggie. Reggie, we'll be with you. Go do your thing, come off that injury, ball out, and we'll see you next year in the draft. Maybe, maybe we're talking about you next year's draft. But for this year, I have a different option here. Now, this one is probably going to go later than what Reggie will end up going. PFF thinks he'll be a seventh round of UDFA pick, but I think he has enough traits where he'll push higher into the draft. This is Josh Imadabebe. Haha, <laughs> Josh Imadabebe. See, look, thinking, how did I say that name sort of right? I listened to it, okay? There was no way I was even going to be close if I didn't do that. And I was kind of sick, you know, messing up names. So I, I watched someone, you know, commentate. And when he caught the pass, I was like, there we go. Josh Imanabebe. I had to write it down like that. That way I remember how to say it. At 6'1", 223, the first thing you'll notice there, it's obviously good size to put on the outside, but it's a 223. All right, that's a thick build for receiver. Okay, pause it. But no, it is. I mean, you look at a lot of receivers, they're like 190, 200. Sometimes you'll get two tens in there. But 223 does separate himself. And I also think when you look at his pro day numbers, 23 bench press reps will separate yourself as well. That I believe was in the 99th percentile. A lot of strength clearly uh, in his build. And you can see that in his game. To me, I look at Josh like this. I look at him as like a blank canvas. The type of player that has all these things that you can't coach. And he's not a terrible player. He's not a bad player, but he's very like unseasoned. I mean, he's very, he's not molded that much to me. I feel like there's so much potential that's there with this type of player. And if we're talking seventh round of UDFA, I could definitely see taking a shot on a guy like this, especially if it's UDFA. I could easily see doing this. However, I don't think he'll fall that far. What do I like? Well, first off, his vertical. 46 and a half inch vertical. Yes, nearly four foot vertical. That's crazy. I think it was the highest out of anybody in this pro day. I'm sure it was. That's a ridiculous vertical. And that's actually important. Sometimes those numbers gets overlooked, but a 46 and a half inch vertical is important because it helps him on jump balls, definitely being a red zone threat where they like to use him at Illinois. He's not the tallest guy, so having a 46 and a half inch vertical helps. Man, that is crazy to think. I'm sure he could dunk that basketball pretty well, but he is a thick and strong build, upper body and lower body. He's tough in space because they, they struggle to tackle him. That's, that's what it is. Not super shifty. You're not going to make a lot of guys miss, but they're just, they struggle to bring him down, and it also helps him running routes because physically, cornerbacks aren't going to throw him off routes. I mean, he can run with a full head of steam and kind of run through some of those you know reaching out your arms so i think the size is a very important factor there and the strength is also very important but he's not slow either ran a 4 4 8 40 and you can see that he's got good vertical speed not the best but it's good now he doesn't gap players consistently i think some of that's because competition in the big 10 is better which is a good thing he went against good competition but secondly there's some nuances that he doesn't have in his game and the burst isn't the best but he clearly is pretty fast i look at him as a developmental outside receiver that potentially could be you know a replacement for tyrell williams Brashaw perriman down the road 
road, you know, because these guys are one-year deals. And like I said, he's just like a blank canvas to me with all the physical traits that you could ask for. Usually I don't love guys like that, but he's not a bad player either. So that's why I was willing to put him on here because he's not a bad player. I've seen him win in contested situations. I've seen the concentration. I've seen the ability to make, you know, vertical plays and uh, make, you know, slants and things like that, get involved in a couple of other ways as well. Dominant in college. I mean, we'll slide over to things that, you know, aren't so great. Wasn't dominant in college. Production-wise, wasn't great. He only had 22 receptions last year. Of course, it was a shortened year in the Big Ten. But, I mean, he never really dominated at Illinois. He also doesn't get tons of separation on those vertical routes. And I think raw to me as a route runner. I guess I'll say that. Like, if you if you watch him play, there's not a lot of, like, little things in his game, little hitches, little things that you got to watch for that gives him separation. Like, Cornell Powell has his little veteran ways of getting separation. He doesn't really have that. He kind of just runs the route. And I think that's why he doesn't get the kind of separation that you would think that he could at his size. And I think veteran receivers will really help him with that. That's, that's kind of what I mean by that. And you also look at a guy here that, yeah, I mean, wasn't always consistently dominant, you know, had some inconsistencies, had some drops. And I don't think he'll be extremely impactful year one. But I do think down the road, this is a player that could easily mold quickly because he has so much of those things that you can't teach. And he could become a really nice outside threat for a team that's win after speed and size on the outside. And he has both of those. And honestly, there's not a ton of receivers at this part in the draft at this stage that have both of those as a combination. So I went with Josh here. Josh, oh, I'm, I'm really pushing now. Imata Bebe. Imata Bebe. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, I hope we draft this guy or, or just get him in somehow because I want to be able to say that name all the time. So there you go. There's the receiver out of Illinois. Check him out if you have not. Let's keep the video going. We have a safety out of Middle Tennessee State here. And unfortunately, I don't think the safety is any more qualifying as a sleeper. But I'm putting him on my list anyways because I want to count it. But I won't be shocked if this guy goes way earlier and, you know, maybe he's surprising some people. But Reed Blankenship can, can can play the game of football. And he brings a lot of the things that coaches like. He won 202 pounds out of Middle Tennessee State University. And you know what's cool about MTSU is when I always played on, like, the old college football video games, I always played for Middle Tennessee State University. I just love, like, the, the whole, you know, their logo. I love the colors. I, I don't know what it was. So if we could get a guy out of that school, I would definitely be happy about that. I remember when I was younger, I was like, I'm going to go to Middle Tennessee State. I don't know why. Don't know what it was about that school. I think it was just the colors. But regardless, that's where Reed Blankenship is from. And uh, he just plays with the kind of energy and the motor that coaches want to see. Down in, down out. He is, to me, like the heartbeat of that defense for Middle Tennessee State. And I think where I was so impressed with him was watching him against Michigan. You know, watching how impactful he could be against some of the bigger schools and against some of the best competition. That was guy that kind of sold me. I think that's the first time I actually really saw him. And Reed Blankenship was the guy that, if you guys remember, we were doing the mock off seasons. I picked him up as a UDFA in one of my mock off seasons. That's how long ago we did this. And now he's looking like he could be potentially a late day two pick, which will be crazy. He does tend to go kind of low, but he can definitely tackle and he's not afraid uh, to really lay the boom, you know, bite some kneecaps and uh, definitely set the tone for your defense. He could play up near the line of scrimmage. He is tasked to blitz. However, I don't know if he's the most impactful, but at least last season really dropped off in terms of production there. I didn't see him extremely impactful as a pass rusher. Maybe it's just the games that I watched, but didn't seem super impactful there. Does have flashes of ability to play the deep safety role. And that's, that's what's tough about finding safeties. I find a lot of safeties that, yeah, they can play strong safety, right? There's a lot of guys that can play strong safety, line up tight end slot, but how many guys can play up near line scrimmage? And then all of a sudden I say, hey, go back up, play my deep safety role. Not many safeties can do that. Challenge yourself and try to find guys that can do that, that are outside of round three. It's difficult to find guys that can really do that at a high level. Cisco may go very high because of that reason of how much he is a playmaker in the back end. Reed Blankenship also brings flashes of that to his game. While there's still lack of consistency, you can tell that he's not extremely comfortable, always back there. He can be kind of lost in terms of Reed. He does have good body control, but he'll flash some very good plays in the back end and show some of that range to slide from one spot to another. And also showing that recovery speed, but the flashes of his ability to play the deep safety position and you already know what he can do up near the line of scrimmage is what makes him a potential really nice player and I think again it's just the energy that he brings to the game that people are going to love to me like I said he's like the heartbeat of that defense in my opinion I think there is some lacking in terms of explosion the biggest worry I have for him is sliding down to man coverage you know uh you know working out of breaks when you're talking about sleepers it's going to be difficult to check every box and I think that'll be one of the biggest questions because he can do it in zone he can line up and slot in zone but man maybe a question 
question at the next level against some of the quicker guys, faster competition. So he could be limited in that way. And it'll be interesting to see if the Lions would take a guy like that. Blankenship kind of has it everywhere. In terms of tackles, he has over 300 career tackles. He racks up tackles all the time. And he also has eight career interceptions. Now, a lot of the past defendant interceptions came earlier in his career. Really didn't see that as much last season. So I think that step back could push him down the draft, that he didn't show as much of that production in terms of uh, pass, you know, pass coverage last season. But clearly you could see the flashes in his game to be able to do that. I also think he's a very good player near the line of scrimmage in terms of reactions. You know, he can get sucked in, but he really reacts quickly back, uh, gets into a quick back pedal. And you see some interceptions where he's done that. Uh, a couple of them actually near the line of scrimmage, he takes a couple steps back and he comes up with an interception. It's like, how did he get his hands on that one? That's the kind of thing that Reed Blankenship has done. So the production is also there for him because I don't think Dean Marlowe does that extremely well. I think Will Harris, you know, may get a bigger role there. We could be looking at a guy uh, like potentially Tracy to get a role there, uh, but who knows, right? He doesn't do extremely well with that out of man. So that'll be the biggest question, which is why I'm going to give you guys an honorable mention right now. And that honorable mention is Tariq Thompson. Tariq Thompson out of San Diego State University. I like Tariq because he fits to me the scheme pretty much perfectly. I feel like he could slide in and fit the scheme. He could play that split safety role, but he can slide down in the slot and he's one of the best underneath coverage guys especially being able to play mainly man but also sliding into zone so i wanted to give you guys another name there just because why not i said five but i'm giving you an honorable mention so yeah uh but he his opposite thing is that range to be able to play this deep safety position not the best speed it's good but not the best speed there and of course competition will once again be thrown up but in terms of a guy that could easily slide a slot 3,000 snaps can slide in a slot can cover that man position be a nickel or dime at the next level and also fit the scheme right away I'm projecting him to be a round four through six pick at six foot 200 definitely look out for Tariq Thompson because he is another one of those consistent players week in and week out. I don't know if he's, you know, broke out to dominance, but I definitely can say there's consistency there. And you look at a guy like Blankenship, uh, I definitely think this is kind of the heartbeat of your defense. I'm projecting Blankenship to be a probably a fifth round pick somewhere in that range, but it wouldn't shock me if he went earlier than that. And then uh, we got another player here because that was an honor mention. We have Buddy Johnson, the linebacker out of Texas A&M. So for the Aggies, at six foot two twenty nine, I feel like I'm announcing a player here. Buddy Johnson. Now, Buddy Johnson, okay, I'm going to see if he's straight up. When I watched this guy, the first time I watched him, I was like, like he looked so slow to me. And I was like, why does he look so slow? My oldest 40 time is going to be terrible. I checked his 40 time. He ran a 4.5740, and his shuttle was a 4.03. I have no idea how he put those numbers up. But I went back and watched. And there's so much I like about his game. It's just the fact that he looks slow to me. However, when you're talking about day three prospects, uh, and I think I know why he's slow, and I'll get to that in a second, but you're talking about, again, day three sleepers, late round. Buddy Johnson could be one of those guys for line. See, Buddy Johnson, I think, is again, a scheme fit. The type of guy that could play in a 4-2-5 defense as one of your two linebackers. He actually can play the strong side. So for six foot two thirty, you look at those linebackers, you're probably picturing yourself, you know, Jabril Cox or something like that. That's not this type of player. Not at all. He plays like he's, you know, six foot two two fifty. 250. That's, that's how he looks on the field. He's very physical, very, very physical presence that can definitely shut down the run game and take offensive linemen. Not, I don't know how many guys I could say at 230 that can do that and that are that willing to do that. That ability allows them to play the strong side linebacker, but also play mainly known as the middle linebacker position. But in a 4 5 I think he could slide right in. At least as an early down player now, maybe he doesn't get super involved if he drafted him. Could be a special teams presence though, because I think that's what he's actually known for uh, early in his career. But again, he plays extremely physical. He's very patient as well as run defender. I talked about Micah Parsons. I loved everything except for the fact that he gets very impatient and he picks the wrong hole from time to time. That's not usually an issue with Buddy. He kind of just waits to make sure that he knows what hole the running back is going through, which I think is very important for him because he's not extremely explosive. He needs to make sure that he's in the right position there. But he can fill the lane. He can pick up offensive linemen. He's a very physical player. So as a run defender, I definitely think there's a lot of upside here to his game. But where does he lack? It's really coverage. I think he's relatively aware. I've seen him follow drag routes, seen him you know, try to keep aware of what's going on behind him. Doesn't drop much in the coverage though. You're not sliding this guy in a slide. You can't drop him extremely deep he just doesn't move that well and I think from what I've read people believe the issue here is that it's a lack of you know flexibility in his hips he's very stiff stiff there and it makes it so he's kind of slow moving you know laterally which I guess does make sense considering you're not running in a straight line versus moving side to side so I understand that part of the game that makes sense as to why he looks slower 
Downhill, though, I think he could definitely play downhill. And he's the type of player that if the Lions look at their defense and say, hey, we need another run stuffer in here, that could be a great scheme fit. Buddy Johnson's probably that guy. I think Buddy, what people like about him most is not even just on the field, but also off the field. Tremendous leader of that team. And, uh, you know, he's kind of just the guy that they rolled off of, right? They played off of him and uh, what he brought to the table. Agility is definitely going to be a question here in space against some of the quicker running backs. Doesn't avoid blockers because, again, the agility, he just takes on them consistently. So I see a guy that's a developmental definitely early down player if you can make him quicker you'd be you know you'd be sitting pretty if you can move sideline to sideline quicker very smart though very intelligent patient player knows his weaknesses definitely tries to do his best to not get himself out of position but plays uh with that type of physicality that at his size you're not going to find much so if you're going to take a smaller linebacker and you want someone that can stop the run you may be one of the better options out there and then finally, we have a defensive end. I should say edge or defensive end here. And that is Teron Jackson. Teron Jackson. Teron, 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 Teron Jackson. I'm, I'm just going to say that. Out of Coastal Carolina. I like that name, Coastal Carolina. I just like that that school name. Obviously, they were great last season. They won 11-1. They surprised a lot of people. That BYU game was just incredible. At six foot two, two sixty, this defensive end slash edge was productive. Now, competition, right? Who do you play against? That'll be a question. I mean, they play BYU, but yes, that'll be a question. However, when you look at his stats last season, 14 tackles for loss, eight and a half sacks, 54 total tackles, one force, one fumble recovery, and four forced fumbles. And the season before that, he was very similar in terms of stats. Back-to-back -back years of incredible years, he was a all-conference player. And then finally, he was actually an All-American in his final year, which is extremely impressive. But when you watch him, he's just so violent. I was actually watching an interview with him as well. I should know his name if I watched the interview. But he even said his favorite part of his game is how violent he is with his hands and that he's a relentless pass rusher. And I think for the Lions here, there is some size versatility at 6'2", 260. I do wonder about that a little bit, how versatile he would be. Thinking of four defensive linemen set, you could push him inside, though. I definitely think you can just because of the, the nature that he brings to his game. But that is his biggest strength. It's his violent hands. Swim moves get him a lot of separation. He can kind of just side swipe, push you off. Got a lot of strength in his upper body. And that allows him to win a lot of battles against offensive linemen. And it allows him to get a lot of production. I mean, I was watching him play against Louisiana, and he was just dominating. It was like play after play after play he was getting to the backfield kind of agile a little bit honestly before he gets past the line of scrimmage in terms of just movement speed but where does he have issues well he did have injuries early in his career his competition as we mentioned he also doesn't have a great bend if you watch around the edge like he might make the first guy like the D offense tackle miss but his bend isn't great so it takes him a while to kind of work his way to the quarterback which can be a an issue if you're a pass rusher, right, on the defensive end position. At DT, maybe not as much. Lions here, if they're going defensive line, I think you go late to potential UDFA if he hits that. And I think that's what you could see here with Jackson incredibly productive. I think there's some versatility. He may have to get a little bit bigger, but I think he can because I think he's very agile now, so I don't think it'd be a big issue. His jump off the snap isn't always incredible, but he constantly wins. He's got a couple pass rush moves up his sleeve, but it mainly relies on his upper body strength and really just kind of shoving guys off and being violent with it. So he can attack inside, outside, racked up production, and uh, I just kind of like this personnel and listening to his uh, interview. The biggest concerns that's definitely going to push him down, though, it could be the Senior Bowl because the Senior Bowl, he wasn't as dominant as maybe people were hoping, knowing what he was able to do, you know, during the regular season, a 20% win rate as a pass rusher is just dominant. And of course, he's a really good run defender as well. But the fact that he didn't really dominate the Senior Bowl, in his one-on-one -on -one reps, he won about 50% of them from the defensive end position, and he won 43% from the defense tackle position. Now, of course, it's not a huge sample size there. And you know, it wasn't bad. It just wasn't great. He did show he could play both positions, I guess, which is good because he lined up at both in the senior bowl. But it wasn't great. I mean, if you compare it to a guy like Patrick Jones, it was better than Patrick Jones, but it wasn't great. So that could push him down the board. But you're definitely taking a chance on, you know, what he's been able to do in in terms of the games that he's played in. It wasn't a terrible senior bowl. It just wasn't dominant. Maybe people were hoping for, but that could lead him to be a great sleeper for a team like well, maybe the Lions. So, yeah, those are five plus an honorable mention sleepers for the Lions in this draft. That is uh, part one, and we'll be back with a part two episode very soon. So comment down below. What sleepers am I missing? They may be in the next episode. Thank you, Brad, for watching, and I'm out.